Chemistry World went to the University of Glasgow to meet Lee Cronin. We talked about his research and met members of his group, one of the largest in the UK. Cronin's research interests include complexity in chemistry, the origins of life, and the automation of chemical research using robots and intelligent algorithms. He told us about his desire to digitise chemistry and to find out how nature created something from nothing when life arose. But he began by describing how his desire to study chemistry faced what, for some, would be insurmountable obstacles. When I was at school, I, in primary school, I was streamed in the learning difficulties group for just I wasn't progressing as fast as people wanted me to progress. And I never really thought it to be much of a problem. Uh, because I was really interested in taking stuff apart and how things worked and I was reading and, and just fascinated by everything. By the time I got to my GCSEs, I was so far behind in terms of where you, I was streaming in terms of the, the coursework. Yeah. And um, my, my father intervened at that point and said, well, he can't be in the bottom. They said, well, he is. Um, and, they, um, and they allowed me, I suppose, to take the exams I needed to go on to sixth form, although the teachers were completely confused that I didn't have any doubt in my mind I was going on to do A-levels because I needed to do A-levels because I wanted to go to university. But then the upside of that, I think, was I realized I could do what I wanted and no one had any expectation of me. So really, I could just follow my nose. I could just follow what I was interested in. Um, I was always in the li local library taking out chemistry books and computer science books. I got my first computer when I was nine years old, ZX81. Managed to get through school and sixth form was like absolutely an amazing experience because everyone wanted to, was interested in stuff. And then at university, equally, everyone again was interested in stuff. I stayed and did my PhD, thought it was amazing. And I was then really hungry to then to pursue my own interests. Yeah. And, and starting in Bielefeld was really the start of that kind of defining my own conceptual um, place in science because I was always interested in how you could get something for nothing yeah. or how chemistry could organize itself. And that's one of the reasons why I was so excited about going to Akin because he was making these gigantic molecules yeah. that would build themselves with no blueprint. Polyoxometalates are huge self-assembling metal oxide clusters which Cronin worked with during a von Humboldt fellowship at the University of Bielefeld in Germany. He worked with Akin Muller, who has described polyoxometalates as having an almost lifelike complexity. For me, the entire reason I went to work with Akin is he, he sold me an idea that inorganic chemistry uh, was the precursor to biology. And that, and that really resonated with me, with my understanding of complexity in chemistry. And I thought, you know, he's right. If we could find out how to turn inorganic chemistry into biology, that would basically open up yeah. chemistry. What I mean by complexity is if you have a series of emergent effects where, if I, where I get unpredicted outcomes from very simple inputs mm -hmm. that are predictable. So say if I put together molybdenum uh, oxide in water, pH 1, and I added acetic acid, what would you get? Well, you'd say, oh, you're molybdenum acetate. You wouldn't expect to get an inorganic fullerene, right. which has got 134 molybdenum atoms, perfect icosahedral sphere, um, nice molybdenum bonds, 30 electrons. Equally, if I remove the acetate and just use hydrochloric acid, I get this molybdenum wheel. I get this different cluster form. So they're very rudimentary examples. The information required to describe the inputs is simpler than the information required to describe the output. Right. And there's no linear dependence. It's a non-linear dependence. And that's really inspired me in a lot of chemistry. It's like, what chemistry can I do where I can get something out now? It's like it inspired an entirely new theme in my group where we can do stuff that will give rise to what I call novelty. But novelty is not just new, it's unexpected. Yeah. And I was inspired by watching children. You know how children discover novelty? Well, the child would go to a radiator and discover it's hot. They touch the radiator and go, ow, do you know what they do? They do it again. That's, no that's novelty then followed by curiosity. So in chemistry, wouldn't it be good if we could app that? If I could do an experiment that gives me something that is completely unexpected, but I do it again just to check it works and it's reproducible. So suddenly I have novelty and curiosity together. And thanks to some really great roboticists I got into my group, they were able to take that child cognitive experience, if you like, and say, oh, this is what I've been doing in my 
cognitive robotics postdoc, and that's what you mean in chemistry, because I was just going novel, 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 banging my head against the kind of the editor's door going novel, novel, and they'd say, no, go away, go away. And what I meant was curiosity plus novelty, and that, we're working on that a lot. We're studying oil and water droplets that do complex and unexpected things when we place them. And they, we have lots of different inputs. We can have lots of different oils and surfactants we can mix in there. And trying them by sitting down in front of a microscope with a pipette all day was proving not very productive and very, very frustrating. And we wanted a machine that could intelligently decide which formulations to try next. So we built a robot to do that experiment for us. We can get some numbers on how good the droplets are at doing what we want them to do. And then an algorithm we choose can use that to predict what experiment to try next. So we have self-propelled oil droplets and they move often quite rapidly. And we also have droplets that do the kind of thing you'd expect bacteria to do when you look at them under a microscope, which is dividing. And some of the droplets continuously divide and divide until you just have nanoscale micelles. Some of them just divide a few times. Um, we have them fusing together as well. And then we have different types of swarm behavior that we observe. The reason why um, we're doing things at the droplet level is we're using an assisted AI, an evolutionary algorithm. So what I mean is you basically make your droplet, you jangle the droplet, move it around, try and break it. And then, then if you like the looks of it, or if it, if you basically, if it fulfills your expectations, say, okay, you're good enough to persist to the next generation, you then keep that formulation and you recycle that around and you make it live artificially and go around again. So the whole idea with a droplet robot was basically to make a, a li uh, basically a robotic nursemaid that allows us to evolve droplets and, and, and select them. Because in time, as we add in chemistry, we are sure that, or we guess that sophisticated machinery that will maintain the droplet's identity and ability to compete with other droplets will emerge. Mm -hmm. I don't know over how much time. Also, it's really cool because there's another spin-off coming where we can now do evolved formulations. Okay. A formulation science is a bespoke science where people literally pass down secretly over many generations the secret to making paint dry, whereas we can use evolutionary algorithms now and, and actually non-deterministic algorithms to search a vast chemical space. And, um, and that's where the droplet stuff is going at the moment. Automating chemical research forms another branch of Cronin's research. In this experiment, a series of automatic pumps mix different compounds to see how they react. The products are characterized by infrared and NMR spectroscopy, as well as mass spec. Algorithms analyze the results and decide what the next experiment should be. I'm, I, I wanna make a chemical drone. So what I mean by that is um, if I was doing really sophisticated molecular, t molecular um, spectroscopy on everything, I would basically do a reaction, um, work it up, mm -hmm. separate it, do high field NMR, do high resolution mass spec, do high resolution I infrared. What we're trying to do is say, well, rather than do all these linear separated experiments, what would happen if I have a cheap sensor like a drone, like an ultrasound, a webcam, and maybe accelerometer, could I inform myself about chemical space? Now, I can't say very much about that because it's very much work in progress, but you can understand from what I've just said and what you've, you've seen in the lab that we're very interested in searching chemical space using that type of on-the-fly direction. There's one problem I'm really interested in right now. I've built a robot to do this. Like, if I discover a new molecule in my lab today, my best organic chemists, which I have a few, let's just say they do a nice seven step synthesis and they make a really cool molecule. It takes them a year to get all the bits and bobs done. They write down the syntheses. They, get, they publish it. Typically, um, it would take an expert postdoc or very good graduate student to pick up that synthesis and reproduce it. Yeah. Is that actually a sensible way to do chemistry? So what we're, one of the frameworks we're building in my lab right now is a way of making that universal and digitizing that so someone can take that code and say, oh, it's code from this chemistry professor, that group. It's brilliant. It's foolproof. I mean, some groups in the US do it right now. They're SI, the, the guy will remain nameless. His SIs are amazing. Even I could follow the chemistry. And it's take, it takes a huge amount of work. Yeah. 
could there be a way that you could just download the code, just like a digital code? You can imagine just like, you know, the way you put a bit of software on your phone and it runs yeah. because you, you compile the software to the processor, the ARM processor or the Apple iPhone. Could you use a chemistry environment where, you know, oh, I know that environment, I've got code, oh, the code in this paper ensures it will be reproducible 100% of the time or, you know, 95% of the time. And the thing is, people don't admit that that's a problem or they're beginning to. Now let's fast forward and let's take it for granted that now I can do a 10 or 15 step synthesis that I know I can have in my lab tomorrow because I just download the code and I have the robot. Then suddenly the chemist can work on the next extension yeah, yeah. and suddenly molecular space opens up because the amount of molecular space that we are able to search is contingent upon the complexity of the building blocks we put in. Yeah. People who criticize me at using robots think that I'm trying to replace them. I'm not. I'm just trying to replace the boring irreproducible bit where they make an error. Yeah. The fact that maybe people think it's not possible, that gives me a bit more breathing space because there are people that are making pharmaceutical manufacturing mm -hmm. much easier, and there was a great paper come out just a few days ago about that. But again, that's kind of still brute force engineering. Yeah. There are several bits missing. But I've got to have something to do in my old age. <laughs> Working for Lee Cronin is, uh, is very interesting. It's very dynamic. You come into work on a Monday and you try and plan out your experiments and Lee calls you up. He's like, I've got a brilliant idea I want you to do. And so your week is different and every day is different. It's also very large groups, uh, growing groups of 65 members now or so. Uh, many different nationalities, many different backgrounds, James said. Uh, many different expertise, which is very useful because we we d the broad range of research is being done. And here I've learned some robotics, um, some new programming skills, uh, a little bit about image analysis, a lot of new chemistry, um, combinatorial stuff, complex chemistry. Getting a meeting with Lee isn't too difficult. If you want to speak to Lee about your project, you can. We, he has a personal assistant. We can find time to talk to Lee. Um, and he's really good at getting to everyone and spending some time on everyone's paper. I would love to push chemistry into a different digital regime from the top down to change reproducibility and availability of fine chemicals and pharmaceuticals in the world. That, that's a kind of now become almost like a goal because a lot of chemists say that's not possible. Yeah. I'm like, okay, why not? What is the barrier? How would the world be different if we could make um, pharmaceuticals that are off patent, but out of production, available to the poorest quarter of the world, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? And then to the richest quarter, wouldn't it be brilliant if we could more specifically tailor the current, wouldn't it be great if the tailored world were able to fund the world that didn't have access to any medicine? That would be a brilliant way to close that gap. So that's one objective for the next 10 years, to build the entrepreneurial activities we've got. But the other thing is, I want to get a hint of the chemical Higgs boson, which is, I want to get a hint of what is it about certain chemistries that allows us to get complexity for free that may eventually turn into a biology. And my guess is it's not what we think. There's a hint from complexity and um, understanding non-equilibrium systems that we the chemist might be uniquely poised to answer some of the deepest questions and if we could use that that notion to really explain to people why chemistry is so important it could actually tell us where we came from what is the likelihood of aliens in our solar system let alone in the in the universe around us and how easy is biology I think that's enough to keep me going for that the next 10 years. 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.